Welcome to the Bradford Literature Festival. Um, this is the winter session, and this session particularly is called Memory of Places. We have with us a panel of three very esteemed guests, and I'll just uh, uh, read out a short introduction of each of them. Uh, we have Umi Sinha, who was born in the military hospital in Mumbai in 1952 to an English mother and Indian father, and grew up in India in the decade following independence. She moved to Britain in 1968. The experience of being an outsider looking for a place to belong, along with the impact of history, political and personal, on individual lives is a major theme in her writing. Omi has an MA in creative writing and has taught at the University of Sussex for 10 years. She teaches creative writing classes and workshops, runs a performance storytelling hub club, and offers a mentoring and manuscript appraisal service for writers called Writing Clinic. Uh, she has had short stories published in the Cosmopolitan magazine and in Serpent's Tale anthology. And she is currently working on a new novel set in Italy and India between 1943 and 1948. Also with us is Amir Hussain. Amir Hussain was born and raised in Karachi, Pakistan, and has studied in, its, in South India for two years. But he has lived in Britain since the 1970s, where he migrated as a young teen. He has published various collections of short stories, um, such as Mirror to the Sun, The Other Salt, um, Insomnia, The Swans of Life, 37 Bridges, Hermitage, and his collection of Urdu short stories, Zindagi Sopehle, um, and Turquoise. He has also written a novel called Another Gulmohar Tree. Amir is a fellow of the Royal um, Society of Literature, and his uh, recent um, memoir, has, which, is, which he calls um, not, uh, not uh, how do you say it, Amir? Not really in... Uh, instead of an autobiography. Instead of a... Yes, sorry. Restless instead of an autobiography. And we will be talking about that also, of course. Um, also with us is young poetess Fatma Ijaz. Um, Fatma Ijaz is based in Karachi, Pakistan, and teaches English and speech at the Institute of Business Administration. She is contributing editor at Pandemonium Journal, she has studied English at York University, Canada, and Eastern Michigan University, USA. She has been a reader at the Karachi Literature Festival in 2020 and 21. Her poetry has been published in numerous publications, including the Aleph Review, Ideas and Futures, Bom and Bombay Review. She also writes on culture and books in Nayador and the Friday Times. Her poetry collection, The Shade of Longing and Other Poems, has just been released by the Little Book Company in October 2021. That is an ebook platform. Welcome, all three of you. Um, I think I will start with Umi. So, um, Umi, uh, what I want to first uh, well, ask you about is your childhood, those years spent in India. Um, post-partition India that, that you know, before, uh, before going to, the, to England. And then, of course, the travel to England and, uh, and the changes in culture and how that affected you as a child and growing up. And, of course, then, of course, uh, we will later talk about your novel, which is also all about these memories and these places. So over to you, Omri. Thank you. Um, yeah, I was born in 1952. So I went to school in about 1958 or nine, I think. And of course, because it was only um, 10, 12 years after independence, there was a lot of emphasis on on Indian history as opposed to the kind of British um, version of history that had been taught before. But I think the education was still very much English influenced, all the literature we read. I don't think I ever read anything at school that was um, 
that was written by an Indian, apart from, I think we did a bit of Gitanjali by um, Rabindranath Tagore, but only because I think he had, you know, uh, his, his poem was put to music for the Indian National Anthem. Um, and my father was in the Royal Indian Navy during the war, was in Britain throughout the war on the Arctic convoys. And then um, after independence, he um, remained in the Navy, in the Indian Navy, which was still very, very British in those days, because I think we had senior officers, British officers in the Indian Navy till the early 60s. Um, and my mother was English, so we grew up in this kind of terribly English environment in India. And as a child, I think when I first went to school, I first experienced um, this feeling that there was something wrong with me, that nobody really wanted to talk to me or eat with me. And it took me a while to realize it was actually to do with being what was called a half caste in those days and the whole caste system and all that. And, um, but I think what I really remember of India is, is the, it's the sensory perceptions that I think never leave you, that they remain with you all your life, that as a child, the temperature, the colors, the noises, the smells of India have remained very, very evocative for me. And when I first came to Britain, that was the thing that I really missed. It was this feeling, um, which I actually describe in the beginning of, of um, belonging when Leela first comes to England, that sense of there seemed to be no color, no smells, no, everything seemed gray and cold. And, you know, um, and still when I go back to India, I think I physically, I feel so at home in India, although mentally I'm probably more at home in Britain now, um, but I still go back to India a lot. I still have friends there and I visit them regularly. So when we talk about memory, of course, the first word that comes to my mind is nostalgia. And uh, all that you're talking about, you know, the sensory perceptions and uh, that, of course, is nostalgia for a place. Um, but um, um, Tell me more about um, your years, your first years in England and settling in England. And, and did you travel a lot back to India as a child or was it after many years that you went back? Um, we came to England in 1968. My mother came back with um, the three of us, my brother, sister and I. And I had, I think at that point, I felt such a misfit in India that I thought when I came to Britain, if I would just fit in, you know, we'd been brought up on English novels and, you know, I kind of, I, I had fantasized this wonderful country, like, like the kind of green of Robin Hood and, you know, um, that it would be this place full of people in kind of carriages and crinolines <laughs> and, um, and also that I would belong here. And we got to England, it was 1968, and it was the time of Enoch Powell's Rivers of Blood speech when he was talking about how if immigration continued, blood would flow in the streets. Um, and I think just before we arrived, the first, um, I think it was Kenya, was it Uganda or Kenya first, where people, where the Indians were evicted from Africa and they came to Britain. And I went to university in Coventry, um, University of Warwick. And Coventry was a town where there were a lot of car factories and a lot of Indian immigrants settled in Coventry. So there was a real backlash against that. So it did feel a bit like coming out of the frying pan into the fire. Um, so yeah, it was it was not altogether a positive experience. Um, and I still feel, it's a funny thing, when I go to India, I feel this sense of relaxation, not just physical, but I feel people are more um, outspoken. Um, I feel I can be myself in India. I notice that as soon as I arrive at Heathrow Airport and I'm approaching immigration, it's almost like I have to kind of pull myself together and think, don't talk too loud, don't smile too much, <laughs> don't, you know, kind of 
you need to kind of be be um, a more of a stiff upper lip kind of person in Britain. Um, yeah. So yeah, of course, and we are talking of memory of places. Places are all about people, and uh, um, so um, also, um, especially with you, since you are uh, coming to your novel, which is called Belonging, and of course that that uh, name itself speaks a lot about what the book is about and uh, about wanting to belong to a certain place and you know knowing um, um, you know you, you belong as Amir does to two places England and India and you especially since you come from a family of you know mom, your mother was English and your father was Indian so um, uh, this novel um, uh, it's based on, I mean, on the characters, uh, the, the, the protagonist um, is uh, recalling things from their, uh, from letters and diaries. Uh, how much of it is your own um, memories? Were there actually diaries and letters that, uh, from uh, your grandparents or your, your mother or your father or something that inspired uh the novel um nothing direct no i think there were elements of both my parents and some of the characters um there are links i mean the book starts in 1855 so two years later there was what the british call the indian mutiny what the indians call the war of independence um and uh my, I'm trying to get, get this right, my great-great-grandfather, the rumour goes, was actually a Panchazari in the, um, in Tatya Tope's army, again, fighting against the British. And after the, um, after the revolt was over, um, those troops were driven north into Nepal, what's now the Tarai. And my father said that his grandfather told him that he had grown up for his first seven years in a forest because they were still hiding from the British. So there were links there. But in fact, in my book, I tell the story from the British point of view, because one of the things I thought was with colonialism or any kind of oppression, really, it's very obvious in a sense what the victims are going to feel. But what I wanted to explore was the damage that it actually does to the oppressor to actually be in that position. And that British family um, actually go through considerable trauma, not just during the revolt, but also in terms of their regrets, their guilt, their um, the change in attitude um, to the British, to Indians that happened between the first British people going out with the East India Company who tended to assimilate into Indian life and then later on in the Victorian period when going native was considered a very bad thing. Um, so I was kind of exploring all those kind of issues of belonging. Um, and there's also, of course, an Indian character in the book, a Sikh who's in England. Um, at school. Um, so there's all kinds of issues of belonging in that novel. The, the Indian soldiers who were fighting in Europe in the First World War, um, the British who were displaced out in India, British children who grew up in India and then came home to Britain and didn't feel at home in Britain at all. Um, and so really I think that was that that was obviously connected very much with the theme that's preoccupied me all my life, which is, you know, how do you find a place of belonging when you've been displaced? Right, right. Thank you. Um, uh, though I am moderating this session, Amir and Fatma, you're more than welcome if you have a question uh, or if you want to contribute anything to what Umi has said. Uh, so um, moving on, um, let me now um, put my first question to Amir. 
Amir, um, you have uh, also got a, you know, you you were born in Karachi, you've lived in Karachi, but you've spent some time in India. And of course, your family, your parents uh, moved around a lot before settling in Pakistan after partition. Um, and then you, at a very early age, you moved to England. So your memories of Karachi, your early memories of Karachi. 15. I was 15 when I moved here. You were 15. You were very young, yes. So, But 15 is an age, you know, when you have, uh, I mean, I remember my Karachi from the age, you know, from a very young age. And uh, and 15 is an age where you, you know, you it's it's you're young, but not that young. You're still uh, mature enough to uh, have lasting memories. Yeah. So, um, so let's talk about those memories. That Karachi, again, uh, your uh, move to England, settling in England, uh, was there any feeling of uh, loss, or did you very quickly uh, assimilate? And then, of course, uh, about your visit back home or visits back home and then Karachi. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when we talk about lost memories and the Karachi that we lost, the Karachi of our childhood. Um, yeah. Well, it, I didn't assimilate, I adjusted. And I think I adjusted within maybe 24 hours of arriving here in England. Uh, I just was very disappointed with London when I first saw it, the first hour or <laughs> two, when I saw these bleaches around Southampton and so on. And then I moved to to live in Park Lane for a few weeks, Hyde Park Corner, Hyde Park Place, sorry. So I was right opposite Hyde Park, which was quite marvelous because that lacked all my, most of my childhood living in big cities like you know, Karachi and so on and so forth. There weren't parks that we could just move around freely or jumping on and off buses you know waiting pound notes of people and being told that we're far too much and uh so yeah it was it was it was actually quite privileged uh it took me a while to feel that i was a bit foreign maybe winter and the fact that the, the reason i felt foreign was that most of my friends at school for some reason now i know the reason it, it's a bit complicated i was meant to go to one school westminster which is uh uh, I just didn't feel like going. I took one look and I said, I'm not going to the school. So I was sent to a tutorial college, which was mostly uh, so Greeks and Persians and uh, Koreans and Japanese and Palestinians. They all went home somewhere for winter. And I wasn't going anywhere because I had just arrived here and I had to think of England as home at that time. So there was snow and it was delightful and there were movies and there was a, all that. So it took me a while for it to and 15 is hungry for experience, for experience. And then there were free books and masses of them, public libraries and then bookshops and the paperbacks were so cheap. It was all quite comfortable. As far as Karachi goes, I had left at 13 because I think this is probably uh, something that I've lived with all my life. I just felt it was time to move on. There was no special reason. It can be said that was partly to do with my schooling about which school i should go to and then when my uncle maternal uncle said at a wedding i had gone to attend uh, at the age of uh, nearly 30 that i should go to uti in south india uh, where he was teaching he was actually the founder of the school and, and the vice principal he refused to be the principal and it was a school that was run on krishnamurti lines so I went and lived there for a year and a half. Not lived, but I mean, I was studying and during uh, the holidays that we would escape to get you know, the planes or to my mother's family. My parents took turns to be with us. It was pretty for the first two months with the lake and the boats and everything like that. But the life there was stifling for someone. So when I went, uh, decided to leave there and visited my grandparents and my aunt in Gwalior and Indor. That was a completely different life because I had only ever been there, you know, as, as a visiting grandchild or, or nephew. But actually to be there for months at a time meant that I had to learn to speak whatever you want to call it, you know, Urdu at home, Hindustani outside, etc. 
most of the time I had to content myself with what they call Bollywood movies today. In those days, we just called them you know, Hindi movies or Urdu movies because so many of them were in Urdu. So I, uh, if anything, I assimilated there to an extent, you know, from being this kid who was westernized and, you know, spoke English better than I did before and so on and so forth. I, I, me and my younger sister, my younger sister and I became much more familiarized with that lifestyle between 13 and 15. So the boy who came from London was equally provincialized as he was a very urban Karachi boy. We go back to Karachi 12 and a half years. I look back on them as fairly magical. At the time, I didn't find them magical. It was just what I was used to. There were certain <laughs> moments, of course, that were magical. But uh, for me, Karachi hasn't gone. I think you've seen that, Huri. You see me very often when I'm there. You know, I move around yes. quite easily. I mean, I'm agoraphobic, so I don't like uh, going in Ubers alone. But this friend of mine who you will have met, uh, who is who's also a young person in Karachi, we were talking about foreigners in Karachi or Pakistanis who've come back. And he said, you very calmly sat on the back of my motorcycle three weeks ago when I drove you into Sada. And you didn't seem nervous at all. And I said, really? I mean, why would I be nervous? For heaven's sake, what would make me nervous about it? <laughs> so that's how I feel about Karachi. And when people okay. bang on too much about I want my old Karachi back, yeah, of course, there are lovely things about it, but there are still very good things about it today. You know, I, I remember nostalgic for my old home. I, yeah. Right. Yes. I, re I remember one of your stories, I think it was in The Other Salt, where um, uh -huh. the protagonist, Samir, um, he, um, he um, revisits the scenes of his childhood and um, he's bewildered by the strife, yes. you know, uh, of, uh, of this new yeah. Karachi. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah so so yeah so i was seeing yeah, that it was in, the in the 90s yeah right 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 mm. uh, i that also was, that was a shock it was not the city but the the, the, kind of, the conditions uh, the, the deep tension that was felt by people yeah yeah yeah, yeah. in particular who was my dear friend and you know, she, she had interjected a lot of this um yeah. you know um uh, i wanted to ask you an hour because you and i are almost the same age, um, how, um, you know, uh, when we were growing up, um, there was a, there was a lot of, uh, uh, there were a lot of Goan people in Karachi. There was a huge Goan community, yeah, yeah, right? There, there was an Anglo-Indian community. Um, even yeah, in school, yeah. in our classrooms, there were, um, yeah. you know, we, we had yeah. students of different, uh, from different, uh, communities, religions, studying together. Mm. You know, how much do you feel that is lost today in this Karachi? Uh, I suppose it is. You know, a literary milieu is very limited anyway. And if you come there for a short time and most of your friends are either bright or with literature, then you you know, by default, are in, a, in, a, in, a, in an enclosed milieu, in a bubble. Uh, but yes, I mean, the school I went to, my one desk mate was Parsi, one desk mate was uh, Norwegian, uh, one was Canadian, one was Japanese. Uh, my best friend for a while was Anglo-Indian, then the one after that was Goan, in fact. Yeah, um, you know, I never thought much about it. Being being that a foodie, I was used to, and yeah. being a foodie, I really miss the Goan restaurants. There was a lovely restaurant called Pereira with a bakery. Oh, I uh, <laughs> my uh, childhood. Uh, uh, Pereira. Yeah. Pereira. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Pereira. Pereira. It was boys that. Yeah, those yeah. brown breads and black breads and things. Yes. yes. Yeah. So there's nothing like that anymore. <laughs> yeah. So the, that's. that's... They've taught bakers and hotels how to do the stuff. Yeah. Yeah, that's, oh, I remember that's... that very well. And then the bookshop had a going name, Anthony Coutinho. Yes, yes. Do well, talking about talking about bookshops, that's another very sad change in Karachi that a lot of bookshops have disappeared. Yeah. We we have now yeah. very very yeah. few bookshops, and they're mostly smaller shops in different localities. But the big bookshops have all disappeared, like Park American or Sasi or you know. Yeah. 
all yeah, these that's, that's where I went. I mean, that was Thomas Michael and Greenwich, Thomas, yeah. yeah, yeah. Mark yeah. and Greenwich, which were just yes. they were walking distance from each other. Exactly, yeah. exactly. So, but I mean, these, there was Thomas and Thomas, and Anthony Thomas and Thomas, well. yes. Thomas but, and Thomas uh, still exists, but yeah. you know it's a very it's very small and it's sort of uh, trudging yeah. along, not not really, uh, you know, doing very. My well. sisters went more to Greenwich because they liked Agatha Christie and um, George uh -huh. Thayer. I went more to Buck America or Buck Commercial because they had things like you know the I I English classic retellings of Greek mythology, and you right. know, it, it, it was better equipped for. for adolescent boys in a sense with the what, reading um, English teen fair what I also miss about Karachi is the open spaces um, you know we uh, it's it's really crowded now and they're, 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 they're really ugly buildings up and uh, the tram you used to have a tram Amir do you remember that Oh, I remember that very vaguely, but I do remember the, I mean, the fact is, I, I grew up mostly at BCHS, mm. and we could play on the streets all day, right into the evening. Mm -hmm. And then you yeah. had to spook ourselves out at eight o'clock, which was to go back indoors. We would imagine that somebody had come to chase us or, you know, run down the street with us. Uh, my closest friend in Karachi I've known all my life, and we often talk about this, I mean, she's lived there most of her life, and she's in defense now. But uh, yeah. purely by chance, she grew up in the house where my publisher and editor uh, today lives. So I'm, I'm, I'm constantly in a house that I played in, you know. But oh, we remember wonderful. how we ran to each other's places, uh, telling our parents. And then in the evening, sometimes we just spook each other out by saying, oh, somebody chased me and chased me. And we had figures <laughs> called the kidnappers because we were reading all this Enid Blyton rubbish and so on, you know, and, uh, <laughs> being influenced by that. Yeah. So um, I was recently I rereading. I ran down the hill from my place to the nursery. Wow. Well, yeah, Hello. those hills have disappeared. There was uh, we used to live in Baudrabad, yeah. and there was a, there was a hill over there also. No more hills in Karachi mm. um, because mm. of all the construction. Um, Amir, um, I was recently rereading a column of yours in Dawn uh, called "Places of the Mind." which is sort of so relevant to what we are talking about today. Uh, it starts with, um, you know, you, you, you talk about uh, um, Muniza Shamsi's uh, um, hybrid tapestries that you were actually are talking about that book. And yeah. you're talking about all the people and how rich the, the arts were in Karachi and how many writers and artists lived here. Yeah. And, um, yeah. Wondering yeah. if uh, you know if if um, if uh, you know you you say that um, memories uh, books come out of places you know at one place you say that and at another place you 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 talk about um, you say it's not always a city that brings a story to life more often it's the story in its intimacy of detail that brings us the living people of the city's inhabitants past and present. Where did uh, I write that? That's you wrote that in that column. It's really lovely. I was reading it's the same it. one. It, yeah. It's in the same column. It's really interesting. Yes. So um, yeah, I don't know how, uh, you know, when talking about how connected these writers who um, like, you know, Manto, as you say, moved to Lahore, or uh, you are talking about Isma Chaktai in the same column, and uh, all these other people, uh, Ismat of course didn't, but so many of the writers uh, chose to live in Karachi. Well, how, um, was in Karachi for seven yes, years. for a while, yes. How connected they were. And then you go on to say that the new breed of writers perhaps is more connected like Kamila Shamsi and uh, uh, H.M. Nakvi or Bina Shah because they write about the city by the sea, you know. So it's really interesting. But I want you now to talk about a little about your latest book, Restless, you know, because that is, of course, your uh, partly your memoirs. And so yeah. it is it is it memory. Part, yeah. 
major part yes so so um, you know uh, you sort of you i have said in your interview also that restless for a, that you're always restless for a place that is always far away so tell us more about the book and your memoirs and how karachi comes across in that yeah, I think most of the book is really about um, experiences as filmmakers, not so much of it is. And much is also about my experiences. So when I revisit the past, it's from the vantage point of the present, you know. Uh, debts remind me of, of, of friendships, like in the case of the writer Hans Huyen, who was a dear friend. I mean, hearing about her death made me write about her as a person, as, as a loved person or, you know, one that figured off memories of another one. So when I go back into the past, it's very much as I'm living it today, rather than trying to reconstruct it, except for that piece, Restless, which I think I've said elsewhere. The title piece, which I was commissioned to write by Grant uh, for a good sum of money, goodly sum of money, right. but I didn't want to write memoirs at all. Um, not that I'm greedy, but that particular sum just said, oh, well, you know, three holidays this year or something like that. But the rest of it, much of the book is about the present. I think you particularly responded to one piece I wrote about uh, the pandemic in London. Yes, yes. Uh, when I first leave the house to go for a walk, yeah, and and I think you wrote really somewhere that you know this is uh, this is very telling for us in Karachi to read about this. I was speaking to all of you from here, you know, writing to the city of my birth, from the city of my adoption. Uh, a lot of the book is that way. That's why I call it instead of an autobiography. Right. Uh, of course, there's one scene which I transform myself into other people or some kind of twin of myself so that I can do away with dates and, 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 and chronologies. And that's, you know, a short, shortish section of the book. Uh, I seem to remember another column of yours in which you wrote that you, you don't usually, yeah. when writing about um, memories, you do not fictionalize. Some people do tend to do that, but you don't. You try to uh, um, be as close as possible, or if yeah. you don't remember, you say no, I think you what don't I'm trying remember. to say is that, yeah. Yeah. And what I'm trying to say is that, of course, everybody uses memory fiction. You know, a few of my stories here and there over the years have been semi autobiographical or semi semi autobiographical. But when I'm actually commissioned to write something like a piece about Horeto Len Heather or a piece about my teens or something, I try to rebuild it as close as possible to real chronologies. I don't have a diary of my teenage years, but you know, I have a diary which tells me about almost every time I met Annie, as we call her, what she said, where, and so on and so forth. I seduced the memoirs to be sure that what I said about her life elsewhere was, you know, um, true. And when I didn't remember specific dates, I would say it was either December or January, you know. But mm -hmm. uh, Annie herself taught me about eidetic memory. She said, look back and see what you can see, what you visualize, and you'll remember a lot of things. I mean, I find things by, by, by seeing them uh, without knowing I'm seeing them. And I also realize that a lot of my aural memory is that way, and I, I can hear things. And I do remember word for word many things she said to me. I can quote her, you know. Uh, easily to you just now, some, something that she said at one point. Uh, and lots of Wonderful. phrases like rare zehni and zom and so on <laughs> and so forth. You know, so it was all that, that memory, that part of my memory was in a way untapped because I had more or less tried to stay away from writing pure autobiography, if there is any such thing, or hard autobiography. I know there are lots of arguments about it, but that's the way I. Just finish right. to speak about my time in Karachi. And mm. uh, yeah, and again, I wanted to shift it into fiction. I said, I'm not doing this. I just left out chunks of it because they, you know, they, they really can't be um, reported in non fiction. Yeah, that's that's a dilemma uh, that, uh, yeah. yeah. And so that's a dilemma that uh, I'm sort of facing because I'm trying to write my memoirs not very successfully. And I don't know where, um, there's so many places where I would like to, you know, where I can't write without fictionalizing some parts of my life. But 
you were also asking me about how I've used Karachi in my fiction. Uh, well, there's yes. a story in Turquoise and Cactus, which is called Electric Shadows. That's really my first attempt at pure, you know, at, at just trying to remember things the way they were. And mm -hmm. much of it is in the present tense, so I'm just reliving it. I haven't changed any of anything there. I only cut out little bits that my, my family was not happy for me to include. But uh, that's, you know, that's my Karachi childhood, which is why there's none of that in, in the new book. There are just little, little Karachi childhood. And when you see Karachi, it's mostly the Karachi of today or just, you know, the day before yesterday, meaning the last 10 years mm -hmm. that you see in that book. Because I Lovely. didn't want to do a childhood. Mm -hmm. Fatma, you have uh, you have written a, a review of Amir's book, and uh, you know that book really well. Anything you want to add? Um, well, I was going to talk about certain things that you guys mentioned, but um, school memories and just connecting it to my uh, own things. But of Amir's book, I would like to, since we're talking about memories, and. Um, he mentions, and it's the first thing that he said to me in the conversation, the first conversation I ever had with him. And he mentioned that, oh, that is Zamane Batin. And um, and I was so fascinated by that. And it's it's this, and it's uh, there's a chapter in Rest about it from the, in, uh, the interior moment. And I was thinking that when we access memories, um, it's not... It's not, uh, I mean, we physically here, so it's the past and present at the same time happening simultaneously. And it's it's in the realm of imagination. And it's it's in that Zamane Batan, perhaps. Um, so um, um, I, I just, I love that uh, aspect. Zamane Batan, yes, it is um, the interior moment. As Amir um, translated it. But of course, it's not mutually exclusive because the interior moment can also be chronologically sound. Hmm? Yes, I mean the way I feel, the way I feel it, it's 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 the realm of imagination. It struck me as that, but try it be chronological. So uh, coming to your own, um, you know, to you, Fatma, about your own work and about your your memories and how you grew up uh, in Pakistan, in Karachi specifically. Um, yes. You know, you, you are from a different generation. Umi, Amir and I are sort of from the same decade. Um, but uh, you uh, uh, are from a different generation, much younger than us. I want to know uh, how you see Karachi, how, you know, your poems reflect the, the disappearance of a certain memory, the disappearance of a place, or, uh, or as you say, connected to a, the disappearance of a friendship or a friend or, a, uh, or you know, of a, of a memory. Um, how, how, is, how, how do you perceive it? Uh, what are your memories of growing up in Karachi? Well, um, you, uh, you both were discussing school memories and, um, and people from different backgrounds. I went to a Christian school, went to Joseph's convent. And um, so the atmosphere over there was always, um, you know, a parallel universe to two uh, religions uh, which were close. That was just the background. But there were certain friendships that I made over there. I was 11 years studying um, in the school, my growing up years. And there are certain, and then, then there were fallouts of those friendships, those childhood friendships. And um, that created, and Amir mentioned the death of a friend. For me, that is, is kind of metaphoric because those friends are still alive today, but I am no longer in contact with them. So they have become memories of a very strange kind for me. And um, when I think of place, so, so that school, that place is, uh, I think it's all connected to time and place and relationships. Um, uh, it's, not just, it's not just an isolation, it all becomes a cluster. Uh, I think Sigmund Freud, in a paper of his, discusses um, mourning and melancholia. And mourning is natural grieving, and melancholia is this unnatural grieving where 
um, you don't exactly know what you have lost and you don't is it a part yeah. of yourself is it who you were at that time is it a place is it all of it together so i and then um, orhan pamuk mentions that melancholia is is in turkish it's called uh, huzn which which has an element of beauty yeah, in it as well. yeah. so yeah. so so it's not just it's not just sorrow there is an element of beauty of having lived those those years uh, with these friends and then there is a loss as well so in my book um the for, one of the first lines of the poems is will the lost um, can the lost return to me and the lost represents places and people and relationships and time and i navigate in the entire canvas uh, of my book can can i make a reconnection uh, in this in this in this artificial time which no the time the place of memories you know which is not which i can't touch which i can't see like uh, umi was mentioning sensory details but for me it's like i cannot touch it i cannot smell it i cannot see it anymore except in my mind's eye um so uh, for me it is it is it is like that and it's like to be in the in this moment in the present and to be thinking about the past is almost like a double consciousness because uh, and and a friend of mine once said that two drinks mixed is 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 a very intense experience so mm -hmm. it it's like the the me of now and the me of then intermixed together at at the site of of a place of a particular school of those particular alleys of those hallways um it's a very heightened experience so yeah it's um i live here i live in karachi but sometimes places of the same city are are almost foreign are almost memories are all, almost of a different time yeah a lot so, of your poems yeah. have this sense of deja vu and you know standing in an old place um recently yes. i read this lovely poem by written by you um called bookshelf of my old room and uh, the last few lines are so lovely yes. i I would love to read them. There's so many books on this old bookshelf in a room I no longer use, in a city no longer mine. Um, I, I, I just find this line so telling. And Fatma, of course, at some point, I would like you to read out one of your poems. Um, you, uh, yeah, you talk about lost places due to losing friendships. And as you said, they're not friends who've died, but friends who you've lost. Um, there's your there's this poem of yours, um, City of Karachi. Um, mm -hmm. How is that connected to a lost friendship or a lost memory? Um, it's 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 one of my and I don't usually write um, political uh, uh, with a political mindset, but this particular poem that you mentioned is talking about that '90s uh, Karachi that we lived when there was a lot of terrorism. on the streets and there were lots of disturbing news uh, that we heard every day and uh, there is a line in in this poem in which i say i gave up reading newspapers i grew irises in my garden strange choice um but i mean this idea that we created an alternate universe these past friends uh, when when we were friends and mm -hmm. we existed in a time where we said we will not let our spirit die of of fear of those of those um, very terrifying times in the city endured and uh, it was like we experienced it all together the intensity um, which has become a, a strange again a, a double kind of a memory now because they we no longer talk i cannot talk about it like you and amir discussing um over a cup of tea you know these french they're just they're just my memories and i wonder if they think about it if they don't uh but i don't know they're just uh, my memories of 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 that time that we experienced together uh, where when i was talking with amir about um you know uh, food places that are gone i recalled your poem um uh, and old cafe forgotten cafe yes forgotten cafe yes yes um, is that about a particular cafe that you used to go to a lot yes uh, yes um uh, there was this um well it was a restaurant i turned it into a cafe in the poem called copper kettle in karachi 
Mm. And we used to visit it a lot. And uh, a few years ago, I decided to go looking for it just to experience it. And I couldn't find it anywhere. I asked people, is Copper Kettle still in there? Zamzama. And they said, yes, in Zamzama. It no longer exists. So um, that poem was, was um, about that. And um, I have it here. If you want, I can read it out. Yes, please do. Yes, just a second. Yeah. Forgotten Cafe. The blue venom of a summer evening enters a glass of water ordered at a forgotten cafe, stings the lips that leave a trace kiss on the rim. I am unaware and muse over your last words, held like a delicacy in my mind. Who would say it's been so long? Suddenly the liquid reaches the tongue, it's poisonous from here on, words don't form in the mouth. Did you ever solve the riddle between us? In an instant age, you have severed impulse. Remember when we learned of irony, it was together. Lovely, lovely. Thank you. So, um, Umi, uh, what uh, for you, um, having lived in England so long, are there places that you've lost memory of places that you know you that you used to, um, you know, see a lot, or, or, or as Amir and I were talking, bookshops that have closed down? Um, well, I grew, I actually grew up um, in, on an inland naval base in Lanavla, which is in the Western Ghats. And it's a really stunning place. I mean, when we grew, when we lived there, it was completely wild, you know, in the monsoon, you'd get these incredible waterfalls, which obviously are still there. Um, and it was like overnight, the, the clouds came very, very low. So everything was really um, damp. So, you know, your handbags, your shoes, your belts would all turn green overnight and everything mm -hmm. sort of smelt of mildew. But it was stunningly beautiful there. Mm. And at that time, Lenavla was just like, I, from what my recollection of it, there was just one kind of square in the village centre that had sort of wooden stalls in a kind of square, and they sold saris and chiki, which of course is a big product of Lenavla, and um, Kandala, where Mulkarajanan, the writer, lived, who was a friend of my mother's, he... Um, he lived on this kind of wild estate and there were leopards prowling around. One of his dogs was actually eaten by a leopard that swallowed it whole while it was on a chain. So it got the le the, the python got chained to the pillar of his house. Well, I went back to Lenavla a few years ago and now it's a big, it's, you know, it's quite a big town. Um, the naval base is still there and hasn't changed all that much. I did go in and meet the Commodore now who who um, is the, my father was the captain there. So he was in the same house I grew up in, the captain's house. Um, but it's strange going back to places you've been before when they've changed so much. It's very much a tourist place now, Lenavla. And, um, and it's lost a lot of the natural, I think the wildness because of the landscape being so incredibly rugged and mountainous, that is still there, but all the wildlife has pretty much gone. I mean, I can remember as a child just lying in bed and hearing jackals and hyenas, you know. Um, and uh, the other place, that, uh, you know, my home city basically, because I was born in Ashwini Hospital in, in what was Bombay then, Mumbai. Um, I go back now and Bombay actually hasn't changed that much. The At least the part that I go to, Calaba and Fort area, which was the old kind of British built area. Um, there are a lot of trees there, very big old trees and the streets are quite wide and you've got these big stone buildings. That hasn't changed a huge amount, um, but the rest of of Mumbai now, you know, it just goes right up to the mainland and it's so crowded and concrete now, you know, that the, when the rains come, everything floods because there's no earth for anything to sink into. Um, so it's kind of like parts of the city, I feel, 
very much as have have changed. This block of flats we lived in in 1962, that flat block of flats is still there, and my father's where my father lived was just opposite. Can I so, ask you what's it, what it's called? But um, a lot of things. A lot of things have changed. Um, I think, so Amir, Amir, can you speak a little louder? I think Omi didn't hear you. Sorry. I said, can I ask you what the black block of flats is called? It's called Dowlet. The name of the block? Dowlet. Dowlet. It was, um, it's just outside Navy Nagar Gate in Kalaba. Yeah. I'll tell you something later. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Go ahead and, yeah, you know, if you want to. My family was in Windmere just outside Navy Nagar Gate. Oh. You know Windmere. Yeah, right. I, I don't know actually. This very but... well. Yeah, I spent oh. holidays in Bombay till I was 30, 39 years old. All right. So, yeah. You know, sometimes places change because history changes. Um, I don't know if any of you, of course, Fatma is much younger, but. Have any of you ever suffered trauma because of a change? Because I, I did. I, I studied in Moscow in the late 70s and early 80s. And I was there till 1983. And a few years after that, everything changed. It was no longer the Soviet Union. And when I went back in 1993, which was the early years of the perestroika, I was... I was there for a few, I think a week or maybe 10 days. And it was, it was a traumatizing experience for me because the change was so, you know, it was, it, it, it was such a huge change. You know, it was a, a, a country no longer existed. Um, you know, uh, um, it was also because it was the early years of the perestroika and the new country was, and, and the people were still finding their way about in, the, in those years. So economically, it was it was a very hard time for them also. And culturally, I mean, a country that was so rich in culture, suddenly, you know, all the theaters and cinema and everything, because, because there was not enough money for these things to survive, which had always been state-sponsored. Books, I mean, I was traumatized to see people selling their libraries on the road. This for a nation that prided itself on reading, you know. So yeah, those early years, now I go back, it's not like that, but that that, that first visit was, I don't know if it's, if any of you has an experience like that to talk about. On the very mild level, I mean, places from London are vanishing that I was used to, you know, my topography of London is changing. Like a few bookshops just went branches of Waterstones where, you know, I, I acquired much of the library I now have. Uh, the French bookshop shut down, the Italian bookshop shut down, they, or, or they reopened in smaller places. So my uh, trajectories of travel have changed. Uh, the cafe, uh, very near me where I've often met Pakistani friends who are visiting, and of course, local friends, uh, including Kamala, who lives, Kamala Shamsi, who's about 10 minutes away from me, and we'd often have coffee here. It's gone. It's become a pret -a manger as of yesterday. And a bus. I mean, this is very strange. We also need to talk about modes of transportation that take us from one place to another. Until uh, last week, I've been able to travel from where I live in Little Venice to Chelsea or South Kensington directly bus. Uh, and that's now been cancelled. So, you know, my route is now closed. That's that kind of thing. It's not devastating, but it's sad. You know, you 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 kind of atavistically sometimes when you're on on, on a bus or a, a walking down a road, look for a particular place and remember it's gone. You know, it's no longer there. And right. The, 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 the amount that the street near where I live, the high street Clifton uh, Clifton Road has changed, is quite astonishing. The the number of Chain shops that have, you know, chain stores or what, what do you call them, you know, restaurant chains that have opened here, including the aforementioned uh, Pret a Manger. Yeah, that's it. So London is changing day by day. Literally mm. day by day. And right. of course, the pandemic hasn't helped very much. And I think even what Umi talks about, the wildlife disappearing, that's such a sad thing, you know, and you think of it in the 
whole prospect of global warming and what is happening in the pandemic and all that. Um, so before we um, sort of conclude, um, anything else any of you want to add to this or ask each other? And then perhaps Fatma, you can uh, read out another poem of yours before we, you know, uh, say goodbye yeah just only talking about bombay and realizing that we are born in the same decade that we've seen the same kalapa uh my cousin still lives in navy Nagar. so it's it's quite interesting you know that those buildings oh, really? that haven't changed even though i haven't been back for many years yeah it's... yeah i i stay with a friend very close to the taj in kalaba so it's still very much my stamping ground <laughs> Wonderful. Fatma, it will over be to you, too, Fatma. I, I have other relatives around Navy Road, but uh, okay, we, over to poetry now. But it's not nice I've had nostalgia yes. about something or, you know, places we both can go um, back to in our minds. This, uh, this one is called Losing Karachi. A strange sun setting upon the ocean, blue, silver, green, of all the things are lost. I miss it the most. And I miss the entirety of relationships. It's noon and it's nighttime, the functioning of a clock and the passing of an hysteric. I miss the boom of the city as it travels upon eggshells, seashores, the intricate seashell design of home and its marvels, the coming and goings of friends and whispers, the fall of dusk and the shape upon the trees of familiar shadows what is preserved in memory as artifacts of a tomb. The silhouette of love and its first fashioning, its drop to sheer gravity of sleep that was lost in wakeful hours. The slapstick humor of growing up, the bungalow at the eastern end of town and the cargo train whizzing by. The first pet arriving like a newborn, his nose all sniffling black, his ears upturned like a bookmark the space of becoming older, dolls losing shape to watches, signboards stretching to lampposts, reminding one of the map of the city, oblong, silver, turquoise, the frame of the sky, and the picturesque sudden star, the only one visible. What does it feel like to be lost on your streets? The star is indivisible tonight, and there are no answers. Thank you. Thank you. That was lovely, Fatma. Thank you so much, Ummi. Thank you, Amir. Thank you, Fatma. This was a wonderful session. And uh, I hope our listeners and our audience enjoy it. Thank you. Thank you. I love that poem, Fatma. And the other one. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. <laughs>